This week on Wealth Track, an exclusive interview with contrarian investor Robert Kleinschmidt on why the Trump rally has legs and the bargains to be found in battered retail and energy stocks. Next on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. This bull market, which has been chugging along with some fits and starts since 2009, has been called the least believed bull market in memory. The naysayers are out in force again during the current leg, which has been called the Trump rally. There is no disputing the fact that the S&P 500's advance accelerated with the election and took off after the inauguration. The skeptics cite all sorts of reasons not to get on board. An unconventional president, sluggish economy, elevated stock and bond prices, and legislative gridlock and geopolitical upheaval. This week's guests call these concerns the proverbial wall of worry which bull markets are known to scale. He cites changes that are not being well covered that could recharge the economy and corporate earnings and keep the market advancing. While legislation has been tough to pass, there has been a string of Trump administration actions repealing rules affecting a broad range of areas, from mining to workplace violations to teacher standards to Internet privacy to family planning and savings plans, to name a few. Under the Obama administration, rules and regulations reached record levels. One good measure is the annual page count of the Federal Register, the daily publication of the U.S. federal government that issues proposed and final administrative regulations of federal agencies. The Obama administration leads the top 10 list of most pages of regulations in a given year, starting with 2016 when there were 81,640 pages of rules, followed by 2010 when there were 81,405 pages, and so on. The administration captured seven of the top 10 records for numbers of rules and regulations in a given year. According to this week's guest, even without legislation, less regulation is bullish for business, the economy, and markets. He is Robert Kleinschmidt, President, Chief Executive Officer, and Chief Investment Officer of Tocqueville Asset Management, a value-oriented wealth management firm devoted to capital appreciation and preservation for its global high net worth clients and institutions. A small portion of its $11 billion in assets are in its Tocqueville Mutual Fund, which Kleinschmidt has managed since 1992. The fund has beaten the market and its peers since then with nearly 10% annualized returns versus the S&P's just over 9% returns and its category 7.6% ones. But as many value funds have, it has lagged the S&P over the last decade. I began the interview by asking Kleinschmidt what, if anything, has changed in the economy and markets in the age of Trump. Animal spirits. So, and that's very important, right? Yes. Because uh, when you have a bad situation, which we'll talk about later which is it, from an economic point of view, uh, which we did have during the uh, Obama years, uh, and you expect things to stay bad or get worse, your animal spirits are pretty deflated. Which uh, means that you don't invest, you, you don't take don't risks. Take risks. You don't okay. take risks. Right. You don't, you don't, I mean, you don't, the, the ban for loan, people talked about loans not being available during that time period, but the truth was that demand for loans was very, very low. Uh, people don't want to go out on a limb when their animal spirits are low. Mm -hmm. So what happened? So Trump uh, was elected, and as importantly, I think, uh, uh, the uh, Republicans held both houses of Congress, so it, it became possible to think about big changes mm -hmm. uh, in economic policies and uh, regulatory policies and, and, tax, and tax policies. And, mm -hmm. Etc. And so uh, that changed the outlook of uh, businessmen and consumers and others, 
And so the animal spirits got more robust. And, and so that alone generated a lot of momentum. And it generated a lot of momentum in the markets, and it generated a lot of momentum in the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, it won't forever. Well, wait, wait, wait. So, so in the markets, I'll give you that. Right. But have you actually seen it generating uh, activity in the economy in that if you, the capital spending has really not picked up, much to the chagrin of economists right. who say, you know, we've seen business confidence go up, but there's nothing to back it up. Well, so business confidence has gone up. Consum right. Consumer confidence. Right. Uh, has gone up, and it takes a while for these things to unfold from the drawing board to actually money being spent. So it's early days. It is early uh, days. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a real question as to whether or not Trump can uh, implement his agenda, at least the, his legislative agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not clear that, that animal spirits can push the markets and the economy forever. You have to have some follow through, and that's an issue. But for the interim period, uh, you've had the animal spirits, and you've also had, you know, very significant rollback of regulations. And that's where the, uh, Trump has his greatest leverage, because that's the, the area where it was, was the most suffocating to the economy during the Obama year. It was the lowest eight-year period of growth since World War II. Two, right. So, so under about 1.5% yeah. GDP yeah, growth. Yeah, right. One point, yeah, something went a little bit higher than that maybe. Okay. One, but, but, but half of the average. Right. Half of the average during that time period and very much below the administrations of Reagan or, or, uh, Reagan or, or Clinton, for example, mm -hmm. um, even George uh, W. Bush. So it, it's a, it was a significantly poor deck or eight years for economic growth. So, I mean, how far can animal spirits take us in that they have definitely picked up? And as, as you just said, I mean, we've certainly seen it in the stock market. Mm -hmm. We have not seen it in the economy. We've seen it in business confidence, consumer confidence, whatever. Right. Um, but, but if, in fact, his legislative agenda is stalled, you know, then what happens? I mean, how troubling well, so is that? Well, so is troubling, uh, but, uh, and I like to compare this with the Reagan uh, uh, re recovery of mm -hmm. the 80s, where w w Ronald Reagan did not inherit, he inherited a, an economy that was bound by regulations, but the deregulation process had already started. It started under Carter. Uh, where Reagan had the greatest leverage was in the tax code and the fiscal, it, but, but that requires legislative action. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he was able to get it, right. even though he had a Democratic Congress. In, what Trump has is he does have, I think, onerous taxes to to uh, repair, mm -hmm. but the level of onerousness compared to 1980 is much lower on the tax side and on the fiscal policy side, whereas the level of regulations are much higher. So, I there's, see. so there's a great deal that he can do, even if he has the trouble getting stuff through the legislature. Uh, but one would hope that, that, there, that we will get tax policy. We, one would hope that we would fix this unitary tax problem that we have with all the overseas money. One would hope that we would get um, uh, capital gains taxes back to a, a level that's uh, you know, not as no, nowhere near as high as they are now, which is 24%, mm -hmm. you know, back, maybe back to the 15% level, because that tends to lock up a lot of capital. Or even 20. I mean, even right. 20. Uh, I think 15 was talked about. Mm -hmm. and, I, you know, and certainly lowering corporate taxes to a level that, I don't know if the Trump number is the right number, but lowering corporate taxes to the level where they're competitive around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly that was one of the reasons, and an important reason why um, why companies were moving overseas, not necessarily the only one, because I think regulations also played a role in that. How sound a footing is the economy on? I mean, we have, you know, the Fed is seriously now raising rates in, in, in a series, um, right. and they're talking about raising, you know, rates again this year. Right. And, I mean, is, is that, if, if you don't get the legislative agenda through, which it looks like it's going to be tough, but you do get the regulatory relief, which you're saying we're getting mm -hmm. uh, through executive orders. Uh, is, is the economy in sound enough funding to continue? It's now the third longest recovery on record right. uh, to you know, continue for another couple of years. Well, I think, I think so, yes, because the, because the recovery has been tepid, there, ha there hasn't been any real buildup of great excesses mm -hmm. in the economy. The big excesses that, that you can identify really are is sovereign debt and the low cost of interest on right, sovereign so, debt. Right, so this is government debt. Right, government right, debt. Right. Um, but other than that, it's hard to find anything that there where you have real 
uh, you know, labor markets aren't really Well, tight. actually, corporate debt, too, Robert. I'm sorry, the corporate, I mean, because of low interest rates, right. corporations have been leveraging, leveraging right. up like crazy. Well, they have recently, uh, right. uh, and, uh, and some of the, the strongest companies have levered up because they have so much cash overseas that they can't bring back. They'll, they'll like, so like a Google or a Microsoft or an Apple will, will raise funds over here mm -hmm. because they can't bring the other stuff back, but it's a wash from I see. Um, but the But 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 the uh, extent of government debt is, is completely unprecedented, yes. and that's much different. So I'll get back to the Fed for just a second, because I don't believe that the Fed actually does lead the interest rate markets. The, the, the Fed is a follower. Um, it can get ahead of the markets, and usually when it does, it, that there are bad consequences to that. But generally speaking, the markets move first, and then the Fed just follows. So and that's the case now. I think it is. That's uh, kind of and catching I, up. Right, catching up with the fact that the demand for loans is getting a little better, and people animal spirits again. So um, the trick of this recovery it will be, and it, it, I don't think anybody can give you a number as to what it should be, but the trick of this recovery will be if the growth is enough so that the rise in the interest rates is small enough so that it doesn't overwhelm the governments with a huge new expenditure. Right. And the, the interest. It's, and that's it's very, so let me give you an example. In 2015, ballpark number, 2016, Federal government paid about $250 billion in interest charges. That's what they paid in 1992. So you've had you know, 25 years of right. deficits and the interest bill hasn't gone up. Why? Because interest rates have come down that much. But if interest rates were to go back to where they were in 1993 at four or 5%, I mean, I think in 2007, the Fed funds rate was 5% before the markets rolled over. If you were to get that back there, then the interest bill, instead of being two hundred fifty billion dollars, would be a trillion two fifty. Oh. Where would that extra trillion yes. dollars come from? So that would screw up everything, right? So the 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 trick is to have growth, but not so fast that that rates move too quickly before we can generate enough income to pay for the debt. And that you know, I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how that's going to play out. That's the one thing that really worries me. But in the interim, I think that there's no reason that the economy can't continue to grow and grow faster than it has in the past. And market valuations, what is your sense? I, so of there, the I think what's important there um, is that valuations are, there, are not egregious, but they're certainly not low, and they're above average. So it's asking a lot to, for valuations in, uh, to to go higher. And it's particularly asking a lot for valuations to go higher if interest rates are going to start to move up. Uh, so you're not going to get the market moving up on the basis of higher valuations. You can only get the market moving up, in my view, with higher earnings. Mm -hmm. And higher earnings can drive and can drive the market a lot higher for a longer period of time. But there, you don't get higher earnings unless you get stronger economic growth. And so it gets back to the need to roll back the regulations, roll back the, the economy crushing tax burden, and let the economy go, but not so fast because the, to, as to raise interest rates to the point where it makes governments insolvent in our country and really all over the world. How worried are, are you as you know, you're known as a contrarian investor? Um, you're, you usually kind of are, are out of step with what you know, the, the yes. herd is doing <laughs> right, right. in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So everyone's been talking about the fact that the that the VIX, the volatility index, is, is has been unusually low for a long time. Right, right. There doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, concern among investors that we're going to that we're going to have a recession anytime soon, that we're going to have a big market correction anytime soon. So there are a lot of animal spirits, and so doesn't that or how much well, does that concern it, you? Well, you know, I'm always concerned about the market, but right. uh, but there are plenty of things to worry about. They say a bull market I know, climbs the wall of worry. So let's start with disarray in Washington, right? That's usually, I mean, that's a pretty, it's pretty big disarray right yes, now. Yes, but it doesn't seem to be it, affecting I, point, the markets. That's my point, the bull, the bull market is climbing that particular wall. Right, right, worry. I see. There's also North Korea lobbying nuclear, or, you know, bombs <laughs> past China. So that's a new development, right? So. There, so there, there are geopolitical worries, right? Uh, and there are there are political worries within you know our own country. Um, so I think those are two 
areas that should give or probably do give people pause. So I don't think you see universal optimism among players in the market. I think you have, there's, I think there's a fair amount of caution. And in fact, if you look at the market so far this year and take out Apple and Amazon right. and you know, no, the Facebook. banks or so whatever. The, Microsoft. You know, the market is really not right. up that much. It's up a couple of percent, right? Mm -hmm. And there are areas where there's been real uh, carnage. And uh, and and you know, as a value investor and a contrarian investor, that's sort of the areas where it, where we're doing most of our looking right, right. now. Right. And to talk about where you're doing most of your looking, because I, I think you had, you had a great quote that you told me something about. Um, you know, you don't, if a value investor has to look where values are, not where you would like them to be. Right. So where, right. where, 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 well, where are the values so where I would rather where not be? Yeah, right. Where, you, where, you'd like, where you'd like to be is you'd like to find the next Netflix. And yes, Amazon. exactly. Uh, um, but I think that, you know, the two areas that have uh, performed the worst um, uh, this year and for quite a while uh, are, are, is the energy area and the retail area. Recently, uh, retail shock that Amazon bought right. Whole Foods. Right. That was the talk of Wall Street. Right. It was the t yeah exactly. And uh, and so tell me about the retail space. You know the general uh, point of view is, was that you know so the so that uh, you know it's bricks versus clicks right. And right. The, the general point of view is that clicks was winning and bricks was was losing. And you know that's true in that has been true in terms of at the margin, mm -hmm. but still the overwhelming amount of retail shopping is done in you know, stores. Um, and uh, the fact that Amazon went out to, and bought stores is a reasonably good imprimatur that, that they think that stores are still that. important. Mm -hmm. um, all the retail stocks were, uh, uh, big retail stocks were down on the day that that was announced. Mm -hmm. um, but on the same day that, that it was announced, and when Walmart was off 5%, they announced that they acquired a, yet another uh, online retailer. So, um, you know, Amazon's buying bricks, uh, bricks and mortar, and, and Walmart, Walmart is going the bricks. other way. And uh, but if bricks and mortar are important, I guess you could argue that Walmart has thousands of stores, and Whole Foods has hundreds. Mm -hmm. uh, so, who's really better uh, positioned? I, my point is that uh, it's so obvious to everybody that it's all about e-trade. That there has to be values, and there are values, I think, in the in the more traditional retail space. Tell me about the the bricks and mortars. Where where do you see value in in stores? Well, the one name that we're looking at, and we've started to fool around with, it, is actually an uh, an REIT mm -hmm. that invests in. A REIT? A, a REIT that invests in malls. Now, everybody knows the mall is dead. And the malls are dying, and and many are. And we're we're way over mauled. And we're way over mauled. Anyway, this company C B L is the, the the name of the read um, invests in malls that are in more rural areas, and um, uh, I guess you'd call them B level malls. Uh, Where there's nothing else going on. That's right. I think that's the key. And I think that the, 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 one of the keys is, and there's another company that we like in this space too called Tractor Supply, but they both share a, a similar thing, which is that uh, particularly in, in less urban areas, uh, shopping is a social experience. And uh, you know, it's one thing we need to live in New York City like we do, and you, you know, it's like you're, it, everything's everywhere all the time, and, and it's, it's easier to cl uh, click on a computer. But you know, if you're living you know, miles away from everybody else, and, and uh, you know, you can still buy it online if you want, but then you don't have any social interaction. Right. So there's a there's a reason that people go to stores that is beyond simply wanting to pick up the latest item. I mean, they want it. They want a social interaction, and in these smaller areas, uh, there's some panache to that. So uh, so I, so we're fairly confident that if we buy these things that, and in this particular case, the uh, Stocks trading at eight dollars a share. There's a ten percent dividend, or uh, as a result of the um, flow of funds from the mm -hmm. from the uh, the REIT. And uh, you know, we think that when it settles down, uh, that the, the stock could be a twenty dollars stock. Now, why should it settle down? Among other things, go back to the tax agenda that we were talking about. You know, the, if there if the tax agenda gets through, it's going to put more money in the hands of middle income Americans, mm -hmm. right? And that money usually gets spent. 
So I could see a, a rebound in retail that could occur as a result of better tax policy and the elimination of the Obamacare penalty on payroll taxes and, and, and all the rest. So, so a modest uh, increase in consumer spending power could manifest itself in better retail numbers. You know, again, not necessarily across the board, but in this particular mm -hmm. case, These in those niches. particular markets, and in those niches, I think that's a good place to look. Right. Energy. You mentioned energy as well as yeah. So energy. What's it? So you know, and I, I used to I used to be dangerous because I used to know a lot about energy. I was an oil and gas analyst years ago. Um, the, the the what you want to own in the energy space, I think, are companies that that do not, are not dependent on higher prices. And, um, and in, in the United States, there are a number of them that, that can make a very decent living at $40 oil, $45 oil, $50 oil, because of, if they're in the right market, the right mm -hmm. basins, and particularly the Permian Basin in West Texas, and if they're fracking. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the United States has become the swing producer right. in, in, uh, in both oil and gas. Uh, and that status may eventually discipline OPEC, I don't know, and I'm not sure it necessarily will. But here again, if you have economic growth, it all goes back to economic growth, which we ha didn't have, mm -hmm. or we had very tepid economic growth, and if we now have more normal economic growth in the United States, you will get a stronger bid underneath the oil price, and companies that can make money at $40 a barrel will do a lot better at 50 and $55 mm -hmm. a barrel. So I, I, I think it's too soon to throw in the hat on the, on the energy industry. I and mean, that is clearly what has been happening for the last several years, and clearly this year where it's been the worst performing group. So that's is, is $40 the floor? I mean, it, we, we've seen it go down to the 20s. No, and, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, don't, think, I don't think it is necessarily a, 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 a short term. Uh, right. Uh, uh, floor, you could go anywhere. I mean, right. b based on the inventory numbers, and and uh, it's important what the weather is like, and and uh, the weather has an impact on uh, heating demand or cooling demand, and mm -hmm. that really affects natural gas prices. And a lot of these companies are mm -hmm. still levered to national gas. So I think you could, you know, you could go to a very low price. But the the cure for low prices in the oil industry has always been low prices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, right. Then so the supply and, and gets shut exactly down. Exactly right. So so I think that, uh, you know, oil traded between eighteen and twenty two dollars a barrel for twenty years before the, it ran up, uh, and it could, it could trade between forty dollars and sixty dollars a barrel for the next twenty years. Um, but if you have companies that are in the right basins and have the right technology. And, that, and technology makes a big difference in terms of production costs these days. Um, I think you can do very well. So Such as? SM Energy is one that we like. It's a $15 stock. I think that um, it's got a very, very large acreage position in the Permian Basin, and, and they bought it at a really good price. Um, they have yet to exploit it all, so they've got a lot of drilling to do. But I think that based on their position, that you think it could be a $40 stock. And, um, and you don't need a higher price to get there. One investment for long-term diversified portfolio, and I might add the last time you were on, which was uh, about a year ago, you recommended uh, so, uh, an area that none of us wanted to get anywhere near, which is probably still has a problem, metals and mining, XME, um, and it was way down then, and it's done quite well yeah, since Yeah, it's then. doubled it, uh, or more. Right. Well, I'll, I'll give you another one, because we're talking about ETFs. I think you could buy the, um, uh, XOP, which is the uh, oil and gas exploration right. ETF, for the same reason. There's right. enough. There's enough negativity there. It's it's down from 80 to 30, and and uh, uh, there's enough negativity in there so that if you did have a higher uh, oil price, you could. I think you could get a spike at it, and you don't really have a lot of downside risk to it. I I think, particularly if you're on a desert island for five years. <laughs> Any plans? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where I took my XME. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Robert Kleinschmidt, always a treat to have you on Wealth Track. Well, Thank it's you. always great to be here. Thank Thanks. you so much. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is think like a value investor. That means seeking out what is unpopular. Where investors least want to be frequently offers the best opportunity for appreciation. 
Year to date, the worst performing of the 11 major S&P 500 sectors is energy, where every category is down with oil and gas drilling companies being the most depressed. There is a global energy glut now, but it won't last forever. The sector warrants a look. Next week, financial thought leader Burton Malkiel shares his views on successful investing four decades after writing his classic, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And if you go to the extra feature on our website, you will hear Robert Kleinschmidt's recommendation for a good summer read. Also, keep reaching out to us on Facebook and Twitter. We are always interested in what you have to say. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend, a super 4th of July, and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholme Foundation.